Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Have you ever had that person in your life that you just can't quite get rid of? And and if you you know if you know that feeling, uh, you must be within the sound of my voice because you are in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide ranging variety of industry professionals and we pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started in filmmaking and TV making and all that fun stuff, and so very much more in a light and conversational fashion. And you know, if we like how you how we do things around here, I'm gonna go out on a limb and assume that you do. Because let's face it, you're listening right now. Uh, hit that subscribe button. Give us the old five star rating and hit subscribe on your podcast provider of choice. Uh, we're available pretty much everywhere over at Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, and plus we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In the Seats YouTube channel. Uh, so if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, we would absolutely appreciate it. Also, uh, don't hesitate to check us out on social media. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram. We're on TikTok, and we're on Letterboxd for all sorts of fun updates. And finally, and I do dare say most importantly, please pay us a visit over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca, for all the latest and greatest from the world of film, television, basically the moving image at large. Because, you know, if we love to write about it and talk about it, and watch it, obviously, uh, we love it when you come by and read about it and listen about it. So please, pay us a visit. On this episode, we got a fun one. It is uh, available on Blu-ray now, but also streaming, uh, either from uh, Video On Demand platforms for purchase or from the Arrow Video Streaming Service. Uh, it's called, we're talking about a movie called The Leech, and it's, uh, well, it's a very relatable story. It's a bit of a, it's a bit of a horror Christmas story, but I mean, it, it works, and it works all exceptionally well. And it's the story of a devout priest who welcomes a, a struggling couple into his house at Christmas time. And what begins as a simple act of kindness quickly becomes the ultimate test of faith as the sanctity, sanctity of his home is, well, jeopardized in more ways than one. It, it, this, this, is, this movie is funny, it's a little gross, it goes off the rails in so many fantastic ways with some fun performances from likes of uh, Graham Skipper and the one only Jeremy Gardner, who uh, I know genre fans will know from films like The Battery, and other things like that, but it is a fantastic piece of work, which I said you can watch as we speak right now on your provider of choice, be it video on demand or from the Apple, from the video, from the Arrow uh, streaming service, or you can go buy the Blu-ray. It's all good. We love physical media around here, so go, go do that too. But first, enjoy our talk with writer director Penny, Eric Pennykoff as we uh, talked about the origins of the story, uh, the potential for a leech cinematic universe. Uh, well... We said that with with a wink and a smile, but still. Uh, and just the fun there in between. But uh, as always, go check out The Leech, either on Blu-ray or uh, streaming on Arrow Video streaming service or on Video On Demand. But first, enjoy our talk with uh, writer-director Eric Pennykoff, because between you and me, it's a darn good one. All right, well, I mean, obviously, just officially, just th- again, thank you for the time. And, man, Congrats on the movie, man. To say that this one is properly fucked up would probably be an understatement. But I mean, it's 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 a hell of a fun ride. I mean, walk me through uh, the origin uh, of the film on your end. You know, really the the quick run through would be like COVID hits, watching lots of sleazy '90s thrillers like Bad Influence, Pacific Heights, Unlawful Entry, movies like that. Kind of starting to think about the classic like straight man versus crooked man story. Uh, kind of in the thriller world, was thinking about it in Los Angeles for a bit. And then, you know, what kind of became something about a a guy trying to get rid of a drifter who won't leave, I kind of was working my way into this idea that, well, what if what if the protagonist didn't want the guy to leave? Like, what type of person would have the bandwidth to to stand a, a person like Terry and not kick him to the curb right away? You know, quite the opposite, pulling him off the curb. Um, and yeah, and just kind of kind of twisting on that genre a little bit. And then realized we were going to make it in the the middle of winter. You know what better time to do a Christmas movie than that? <laughs> was uh, was Jeremy always going to be your drifter, your dirt bag? Because I mean, he makes a glorious scumbag. He, <laughs> he is perfect in the part. <laughs> yeah, he is. I mean, um, you know, really, all, all four of them in this movie. Um, I conceived the parts for because it was very much like wanting to make a movie during COVID. Uh, fortunately, I have a really great group of people. Some of these I've made a movie with before, others I hadn't, but we were all friends in one way or another. So it was kind of a, a real ask on my part to say, hey, I want to produce and direct this thing. Um, 
I think I've written something that we can do that's tailored to, you know, four people that I think are incredible actors, both in this movie and on their own. Now, I mean, something I really appreciated is that this it doesn't veer too far away into thriller it lets you it lets us have a few laughs along the way how important was it for you to sort of keep the comedy going in all this even as like things were spiraling worse and worse out of control i think once i realized it was going to be a priest and you just have someone who you know especially a catholic priest uh has a lot going on under the engine and in the background and putting someone like terry in his life i mean there's you know, once I was kind of hooked by the hook, there was there was no way that it wouldn't be funny or it wouldn't just be, you know, uh, uncomfortable to watch or awkward or whatever combination of those things. But I but I was really hoping that it would be funny. So I'm I'm happy to hear that the the comedy element of the horror comedy is working for people. No, I mean, on something like this, how uh, I mean, having met Jeremy, I know he's a bit of a live wire, but I mean, how do you like do you got do you let people go off script or are you sort of precious to the words of the page, especially when you know you're mounting your own feature you know this one specifically i remember where so much of the prep was done like you and i are doing right now which is over zoom you know right. the, the actors all came from three different states pretty much the movie is comprised of a cast and crew from four different states so a lot of the prep was like this and i think um i think i was probably a little maybe a little more strict on this movie than my first movie about like let's really let's really work through the script as boring as it is over zoom, just doing read throughs and things like that, because the producer and me knew that I didn't have a lot of time to make this movie. So as much as I would want to, you know, experiment and kind of allow extra time for just figuring things out, I, you know, I, I had so many things to take into consideration to just get an effective film finished with no one getting sick and on time and on budget um, where I think, I think we really nailed down uh, a, a lot of what you hear and see is very much on the page. Um, that being said, I mean, they're all wonderful at improv. Like certainly Jeremy and I have an interest in, you know, the world of John Cassavetes and Robert Downey Sr. People like these, it just kind of like, you know, they just didn't give a fuck. Like they were, they were down to do, um, down to do about anything, experiment. But I, I definitely was uh, probably a little more stringent this time about uh, let's really get it on the page first. And uh, probably also went down to me as a writer too. What is it about sort of the, the duality of, like you said, on one end, this holy man, his house, church, and then these these two miscreants sort of mixing in, which, which, which makes for, for such a delicious story. Because, I mean, something else about the film, and I mean, I know obviously budget and constraints and even COVID are probably going to pay a certain factor into this, but I appreciated the fact that, at least until the end, you kept the violence and the blood to fairly minimal yeah i i think it's certainly the the threat that something's going to erupt you know how long can you go kind of letting that boil before you have to really kind of let it go and you know the the idea was to always kind of really let it rip in the third act um and just you know keep it going till the end but um yeah i think uh yeah you know i i think you 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 do your best to to write something that's engaging all the way through you know you're always trying to keep up the momentum even if it's just characters in a room talking to each other but so much of i think what what you're getting at is taking scripture, actual, you know, religious doctrine and just flipping it on its head or taking it literally, which is something that, you know, many Christians would tell you not to do is don't take some of the stuff in the Bible. So literally kind of ignore the, that first chunk of the book and focus on the back half. But what happens when someone, you know, kind of gets enamored by the first half and the back half and where those worlds kind of collide? It's kind of where David goes in the end. God was a badass. Absolutely. <laughs> Now, I mean, uh, I've got to ask, because on something like this, obviously, you're going to make it, you're going to put it out there, you do your festival run, but I've got to imagine getting the call from a company like Arrow is, is a different thrill in and of itself. Can you walk me through sort of that initial phone call? Yeah, I, you know, it really has to do with Fright Fest is a big piece of this. Right. It's, uh, what, you know, one of the best festivals out there. And my, my first film... Uh, got into Fright Fest in 2019, and I'd met a couple of the people that worked there and got to know them a little bit. Um, kind of already had a distribution deal lined up with that first movie. Um, not that there was an offer or anything like that um, on their part, but we just kind of kept in touch. And when I went to go make this movie, you know, and started to share early links with, you know, people who might be interested, they were top of my list to send it to. Um, and then certainly this last time being here this past August, uh, spending a lot of time with Kevin and Lou and, you know, the whole team. It's, uh, it's been great. I mean, you know, I was a fan of Arrow first and foremost, and to, to see the movie kind of get the, the Royal physical treatment, um, 
is great. I mean, if it's well, I mean, I've got to imagine it's a bit of a trip because on one end we're all fans and we're all spending way too much money on the sales, but then to have one with your name on it on the shelf is going to be a different is going to, is a different thing entirely. <laughs> yeah, I think on my shelf I have it wedged between uh, Wild Things and maybe Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I don't oh, really have much. I, 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 I like that. I don't have I don't really have much order to my shelf, but I think currently uh, it's kind of wedged somewhere between those two. <laughs> No, and I mean, it's available on streaming, too, and it's one of those things where, I mean, at least for me as a fan, I mean, I'm kind of, I'm so happy that uh, sort of independent genre cinema has sort of these outlets for for more and more audiences to see, you know, great, great filmmaking. And I mean, I'm kind of curious from your perspective, just as you keep going forward and plan the next one, like, how important is it for you to know that, okay, there's options out there? Because, I mean, even as little as five, ten years ago, there weren't as many options. Sure, no, it's... it's... Uh, definitely something you take into consideration. I mean, we're very lucky that, you know, someone like Arrow that we're all fans of is, you know, kind of championing some of these smaller indie genre films. I mean, a bunch of stuff they put out has been great. Um, and I think you kind of need that too. You know, it's like, you got to hit it from the streaming side, the physical side. Uh, obviously theatrical is still like a very important thing to me. And while we didn't get it on this film, I felt like I really got something on this film, which was a proper physical release, which is something that my first film did not, you know, it was pretty, pretty much put out by a, a straight to VOD distributor who kind of deals in the bulk of films and, you know, as opposed to really tailoring a, uh, released to specific titles like Arrow does. So it's it's definitely been a total 180 sort of in terms of, um, you know, working with their PR and really getting getting the movie out there to people and having an opportunity to talk about it too. For sure, man, for sure. I mean, something else about the movie, which I really appreciate it, is it's one of those horror movies that feels like you could tell uh, you could tell other leech stories that would be completely separate for, for, <laughs> from these characters. I mean, and I mean, I'm curious for you, what is it about horror that allows a certain degree uh, of universality? Because, like, you're not necessarily married to this world specifically with the idea of the leech. You could really transpose that to, to many other places if you wanted to. Yeah, well, certainly that says something about uh, our society or our world if a leech story could kind of continue to go on. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, it's, I, I don't know. I mean, why it's like, why is horror kind of keep making sense? I guess because things are fucked up and crazy and you need something to kind of contextualize all of it it's you know to some degree but um yeah i i i, I don't know I, I think you definitely could do another leech story uh you know <laughs> i don't know i don't know how much of uh, how much of one i left it open for at the end but um you know if someone if someone sees the uh the leech cinematic universe you know <laughs> i love it up, let me know but i mean Something else about the film which I appreciate is there is a like there is a dark and a grittiness to it. Can you talk to me a little bit in just in terms of how you wanted the aesthetic of it all to look? Because I mean, obviously the house, it's his house, it was his mother's house, but there is that age there. Like you can almost feel like sort of the layers of dust there. So the grime is kind of not that far away. Like, how important was it for you to sort of craft something that looked nice but was like on the brink of being filthy? I mean, I think in like you know, uh, the very classical horror sense, uh, you know, just thinking about Psycho, just yeah. kind of like, you know, like what it, this guy is, you know, <laughs> how how far away is Father David really from uh, from Anthony Perkins in that film? I I, I don't know. I, I think um, I think you kind of start with like the the big dream house of like what this guy's life might look and then you kind of like boil it down to not only what it might work for this guy, but what you might have access to. And of course, like it's not hard to find a dusty old house to make a movie in, I mean, maybe horror is, uh, you know, so appealing because you you can find some of these some of these buildings. It's not hard to find a a creepy cavern or an empty warehouse or a dusty old house or I don't know cemeteries all are all you know kind of all over the place. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's that, and then also the way the camera moves and the overall I guess approach to to the lighting and color was really wanting to do something that was different than my first film, which was very kind of like high contrast, uh, lots of color. Uh, everything was on a dolly. The camera was very much like kind of a cumbersome thing to move the way we did it on that a little bit, which gives you a beautiful sort of like creeping effect for a movie like that. But for something like this, I remember just wanting to grab the camera handheld and just get it in someone's face for and sure. just feel like with a small crew, we could put together a small package, lean into the shadows of the house, fits the story, fits what we have. Um, you know, you try to let the aesthetic be dictated by 
the story and kind of just, you know, where, where you're going to shoot this thing. Something else I really appreciated is that it's, I mean, just even in horror in general, it's, it's the one genre that throws out the rules it kind of throws out the beats like if if the if you were trying to make the leech as a rom-com there would be certain beats that you have to hit but you don't have to do that in a horror movie i'm kind of curious what is it about that for you as a filmmaker that kind of draws you in well just thinking about the beats for a second i felt like you know musically the composer and i talked a lot about trying to hit those sort of like commercial hallmark movie beats with the way that it kind of prances along until it, you know, dissolves into something else. Um, but, but I think in some ways, the first half of the movie, I was really trying to adhere to a very like quick, uh, you know, progressive structure of one thing leading to the next. And all of a sudden, you know, halfway through the movie, this guy is, you know, getting blackout drunk. I mean, it kind of, you got to be kind of strategic about how you do that in 35, 40 minutes. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, there's a wink and a nod to it as well. Like, it's a, it's not a question of you're not leaning into the beat because you have to. You, you're doing it as an acknowledgement and sort of as an advancement of the story. And I mean, I think that's why it works so well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, I pitched it to everyone as the holiday Hallmark film from hell for a while. And I, I felt like everyone just kind of eventually got the gist of it. Like, I think that helped everyone kind of loosen up and have fun with what we were doing, you know, because the movie does so good, go into such dark places that, you know, everyone kind of knows that, like, you're making this crazy movie, but it's almost like intentionally the anti Hallmark movie. Um, you know, it, it kind of pushes everyone a certain direction. See, then I counter programming. I got it like movie of the week in the Hallmark channel. Just, you know, put it in like that 1159 slot and let her rip. Well, I know I need to tell Arrow if they had like a, like a continuous TV streaming platform just to do 24 hours of a leech. <laughs> No, I mean, just to start putting a bow on this, I mean, it's a silly question, but it's one I always like to ask. Can you think back to the younger days? Was was there like one movie that you saw that had the light bulb go off for you that made you go, you know what, I want to be a filmmaker? Um, probably the earliest thing, which didn't really lead to me doing anything movie related, would just be, uh, you know, seeing the making of Jurassic Park on VHS. Oh, it's, wow, just okay. one of the, it's, it's one of the early VHS I had. It's uh First time I ever saw titles like production designer or director of photography. I had no idea what any of that shit meant prior to that. Um, and just, I think that planted a seed, but really didn't act on it for a number of years, really until uh, later into high school, playing music, kind of just being interested in the visual arts and then coming across um, a lot of these early films from Glass Eye Picks uh, that Larry Fessenden was producing and directing himself and kind of really being inspired by like that new york independent just grab a camera and go make a crazy fucking movie sort of thing you know plus his movies had something to say on some sort of moral ecological level which was cool it felt like the the perfect melding of all these different things um yeah no that's cool man i like that i mean i like the jurassic park reference too because i mean it really does speak to just the reality of i mean even if it's you and a small crew or if it's a if it's an army of hundreds i mean it it all starts by just you know picking up a camera and having an idea and i mean i think that's the at its core that's the magic of cinema and i mean with this uh again it's a simple film but i mean it's it's a hell of a lot of fun and i mean it's one that just sucks you in and you can't let go of it and man and i just i absolutely loved it and i mean i'm so glad the world gets to see it now but again man congrats on the film and again thanks so much for the time today yeah thank you the whole cast and crew is incredibly excited to see the reception it's been fucking awesome so far you know not many of us made this film so it starts off small and the fact that the people who are seeing it now are seeing it it's, it's amazing Keep, get get back to work on the, the leech cinematic universe and we'll talk <laughs> <to> you, <man. laughs> sounds good and don't forget to to visit our friends over at bay street video for all your dvd blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well over at 1172 bay street toronto ontario canada you can give them a call at 416-964-9088 that's 416-964-9088 or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your dvd and blu-ray needs <laughs>